All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome to Power Mapping with the Chicago Democratic Socialists of America. Um, my name is Haley. I am a former political and labor organizer. I've also been a DSA member since 2017 and a Chicago DSA member since 2019 when I moved back to Chicago from the Twin Cities. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank uh, some folks for helping me out. Uh, thank you to Sarah Richmond and Rachel Zebrat for helping to coordinate along with Sarah Hurd and Angela Janus. I really appreciate it. Um, also, thank you to all of you who are uh, attending this right now. Um, ordinarily for a training like this, when we're talking about power mapping, I would love to use breakout groups and have a whole bunch of interaction and make people like get on the floor and stuff like that. Um, but there are limitations with Zoom and also limitations with the amount of time that we have. So if you have a specific question or a concern or a comment, um, I'm gonna ask you to message Sarah Richmond directly and then she will either um, answer it to, to you directly if it's something that can be answered or to toss it back to me during the question and answer period at the end. Um, there are also uh, a few moments during the training where I'll ask people to throw out answers or examples in the chat. Um, and so we can use the chat function um, as a way to communicate effectively while keeping time in mind. Uh, speaking of time, this training is going to be about an hour, and then I can stick around for another 20, 30 minutes or so, depending on what kind of response we have. So let's talk a little bit about our good old CDSA standard. We use feminist process in CDSA. It is a process born out of uh, historically out of women's groups to acknowledge different power dynamics that appear in group settings, even ones like this on Zoom. Um, so here are our five rules. Um, respect the discussion of the facilitator, uh, share the air and encourage others during the Q&A section, um, consider your position, meaning considering your place in the world, your race, your gender, your class background, etc. Make I statements, speak for yourself, and also practice or assume good faith. Well, let's get started. So this training today, we're going to, uh, hopefully folks will leave here with three core takeaways. Um, the first of which is how to identify allies and opposition around a core issue with identifying uh, decision makers, zeroing in on those relationships, figuring out incentives and vulnerability to costs. All of those things will make sense at the end of this. Um, how to identify what assets and connections an organization possesses, for example, our organization, DSA. And then also within a given structure, how to identify individuals who have a disproportionate in impact, also known as organic leadership identification. What is power mapping? So power mapping is the practice of creating a visual map that tells us, the organizer, three things. Uh, so who is the power to make a change? Who is the power to try to stop us? And also what do we need to win? So there's a few benefits to creating an actual visualization. So that's what the power map is, it's an actual, thing that you can look at and see. Um, so first of all, uh, it's going to let us, if so if we're going to evaluate a set of relationships around an issue, we need something that's going to allow us to quickly summarize our assumptions about relationships. And that's going to reveal holes in our preparation to, that's gonna reveal holes in our preparation. So, Visual representation is also going to allow us to work on our knowledge as a group. So oftentimes when you're doing campaign planning, having a handful of situation, a handful of people who know the situation isn't good enough. We need to be able to have a, a much larger group understand the plan so that everybody can meaningfully deliberate on what actions we need to do. And then finally, 
uh, a benefit is that we need to understand the relations of power in order to be able to explain credible plan to win. So we're gonna talk about two different things and how they relate to each other specifically today. So the power structure analysis as well as relationship charting and those things work in tandem together. Um, so first of all, we wanna know who our target is and if we have the right one. We also want to understand who our allies are, and those are people who are for our issue and why they are against us. We also want to know who our opposition is, uh, which are people who are against our issue and why, and then what each power, what power each of those groups has in influencing our goal, either positively or negatively. And then once you have your analysis done, you're going to want to map your relationships to the target. And this means who influences these folks? Who are they afraid of? Who do they admire? Which groups and institutions do they care about? Um, and that's gonna allow us to pick tactics to create a winning strategy. Uh, I'm using a ton of jargon, folks. And as we go through, uh, I will be defining a lot of that jargon. If there's anything that you were like, I don't know what she's talking about, go ahead and ask Sarah. I, there will also be a handout at the end that will include definitions for a lot of the things that I'm speaking about. So before you start your power map, we need to know what we care about, what our demands is. So we need to choose an issue. Our issue is a problem that needs to be solved. So we can also think of it as our goal. So while we're picking our issue, we wanna think uh, through um, some things to know whether or not it's a good issue to pick. So we wanna have a clear demand that we can mobilize our resources and organize new people to achieve. So asking ourselves these questions, is this a winnable demand? Uh, is there somebody who even has the power to say yes to this demand? Um, does that person have the resources to do what we want? Um, is this issue widely and deeply felt? Meaning do uh, a lot of people care about it and do they care about it a lot? Um, so another way to think about that is, is this an issue that's going to polarize disengaged people and then mobilize the base? Uh, and then is this issue transformative? Um, so, and is the fight transformative to win the issue, right? So if we win this issue, is it going to transfer power to the working class against an oppressor? And will this bring the moment, the movement directly into confrontation with the oppressor, right? So does it create that friction that's necessary to win? And then the last thing is not necessarily necessarily something that has to happen, but it is important in thinking about our organization, but does the fight um, build organizational power? Does it build our own organization? Just all things to think about. So picked our issue, got it. Now we want to know how do we win this? So we've got to identify our targets. So a target is a person that has the power to meet a demand. So a few things to note on targets. A target is always a person. It is never an amorphous group. So it's not city council. It is a specific number of city councilors or a single city council counselor. It's not Congress, it's a congressperson. Um, it isn't uh, a corporation, it is the CEO of a corporation or the chief financial officer of a corporation. Um, it's always a specific person. Um, so while a target is a person, the tactics that you're going to use to pressure that person are often not personal. They can be, but they are not. Um, they don't have to be directly personal uh, to the target. We want to make sure that our target has the power to say yes to our demands. So if multiple people have to say yes to meet our demand, then we are going to be running multiple parallel campaigns because each of those targets is going to care about something different. 
And then we always have to know how a target gets their power. Um, so who has to cooperate for them to use their power? Um, what coalitions do they need to use to maintain it? Um, is there somebody or a group of somebodies that can remove their power, right? Like a board. Um, so how might our understanding of a campaign against a target change based on who they are, right? So if they're an elected target or an appointed target, maybe they're a public target, or maybe they're a private target as an executive or an owner. So each of these groups has a different way that they acquire power. And so that means that they're going to have different relationships and they're going to have different concession costs and vulnerability to disruption costs. So we're gonna to return to those concepts a couple of times throughout this presentation, um, but we wanna start thinking about what are the concession costs and the vulnerability to disruption. So what makes a target powerful? Um, if elected, what is their voting record? Where do they get their donations from? Uh, where do they get their votes from? How close was their last election? How many registered voters do they, had, do they have? Uh, if they're appointed, who hires or fires them? What cooperation do they need uh, to be successful? Um, if they're a private actor, oftentimes that's a CEO or uh, somebody like that in private business. Um, how does their business make money? Um, is their business a hot shop? Meaning, do they have uh, sustained uh, rampant severe violations against their workers? Um, do we have an in with the workers? Um, do they sell to the general public versus contractors, right? We want to figure out um, why is this person that we're targeting a powerful person that can meet our demand? So let's return to the core question of cost, okay? So again, we're talking about concession costs and vulnerability to disruption costs. So we wanna ask ourselves, what does it cost the target to say yes to us? So why, assuming you know the target has not already taken up our demand, is it because they don't care? Is it because they don't believe there's enough support to win? Or uh, more likely, is it because the costs of them saying yes to our demand are too high compared to the pressure that we have put on them, right? So each of these um, things is going to create different tactics and narratives. So it's really important that we're gonna test this, uh, just like it says here, early and often. Right? We're going to continue to test our assumptions about how much pressure we need to put on them uh, because we want to be able to test whether or not they're ready to say yes. Uh, so when we're thinking about this, you know, what does it cost an older person to support rent control versus the landlord versus the head of the realtor association? Similarly, um, an older person to support, support democratizing electricity? What does it cost the mayor versus what does it cost the Exelon CEO, which is ComEd's parent company? Um, again, notice all of these are individuals that can be targeted. So we have our issue, we've got our target, and now we need to have a power map, all right? We're gonna put that all together. Once we know our issue, uh, or and the goal that we wanna to get to, and we know who has decision-making power, AKA our targets, uh, we're gonna Kevin Bacon it, okay? We wanna figure out who is connected to the target and how closely they're connected. So we do this to figure out how to put pressure on the target, how, what tactics we need to use to put pressure on them. So what we need to do is brainstorm a list of relationships connected to the target which again, I cannot stress this enough, is always a specific person. And then we're going to use a graph to map them. So this is what that graph looks like. So as you can see, on the x-axis, we are measuring the level of support 
uh, for us as that a stakeholder has for the issue. And then on the Y axis, uh, which is the one that's going vertically for folks who haven't been in math class for a while, um, we're measuring the amount of influence that person or stakeholder has over our target. So what we're going to wanna do is identify as many stakeholders as possible, and then put them on the map according to perspective and influence. And you can see on the map that uh, the further to the right you go, the more against the issue uh, our stakeholder is, the further to the left, the more for our issue the stakeholder is, the higher up, the more influence, the lower down, the less influence, the less power. So the x-axis, this is our stakeholder's position, right? So example of Stakeholders include unions, community groups, faith groups, businesses, elected officials, and a good way to brainstorm who stakeholders might be is thinking through, you know, who is responsible for creating this problem? Um, you know, who has the power to fix the problem but isn't? Um, people who are uh, geographically or ideologically relevant to the issue, so that's your community groups, faith groups. Um, people who are already working to fix the problem, you know, people who might be in coalition. And then we never want to forget ourselves. So in this case, you know, DSA, our own members, where do we fall on this map? Then uh, we look at the X, the Y axis, which is attributing the power of those stakeholders, right? So we want to ask ourselves how much, what is the primary source of each player's power and how much influence do they have, right? So thinking through, you know, who controls the institution, um, what money do the stakeholders have and what is their ability to donate and spend it? Um, what's the media access or coverage? Um, perceived expertise, for example, if you have a, uh, a doctor, right? They might have more influence because they have a level of expertise that denotes them more power. Um, what's the membership, right? So in DSA, to have a large um, active membership could increase the amount of power that we're going to attribute to ourselves. So now we start our map. So generally what this looks like in practice when you're putting together a campaign is you're gonna to wanna to have a large space, uh, either a big piece of butcher block paper, you're gonna draw a graph on the floor, you're gonna do it on a whiteboard, um, you're gonna do it on a piece of paper, but it's most helpful to do it where a lot of people can see and participate at once because the I think one of the best things about power mapping is having people in conversation with each other and having a healthy open debate about how much power and like people and stakeholders actually have. Um, so we're gonna take all the stakeholders, get them on the board. And we wanna be honest ourselves about what the actual amount of power and influence each of these groups have. Uh, it's really easy to over or underestimate these things, especially if you really want uh, to win your issue, right? You might overestimate the power that uh, the for group has and underestimate the power the against group has or vice versa. Um, so another thing to think about is, you know, always do this in, the, in a group. Um, so this influence and dedication is going to be a subject of disagreement. It just is. And the debate is what makes this special and what makes this important. Um, we're also going to want to know if stakeholders have, have strong relationships to each other. And then the last thing to keep in mind is that this is not the territory. So we're using this in the abstraction to make chaos manageable. This does not have to be exact and you are not married to this map because it is going to change. So we've got stuff on the map and we need to assess our power. Uh, like I just said, the power map that we create is not static. 
So as organizers, we need to assess and our build our power to change the map and win our target towards an issue or push our target towards an issue. Again, for anybody who loves math, by the way, folks, I failed algebra like six times. So this is my worst nightmare that I'm doing math for a living now. Um, so when the scatter of stakeholders trends in a line moving up and to the right, like the left uh, hand, the opposition has more power and influence over the target. This might be a harder campaign to win, right? When the scatter of stakeholders is moving uh, up and towards the left, the supporters of the issue are going to have more power and influence over the target. Now, this is kind of the basic idea um, and something that's really helpful to see visualized. However, it's never actually going to be this simple. You could have a straight line. Um, you could have uh, 30 community stakeholders on the left and two huge corporations on the right. And that's going to be a discussion about how that dynamic of power shakes out. But once we have our map, we're going to assess the vulnerabilities of strength of those in power on either side of the map to help us out. Uh, so we've got our map, got our positions, and now we need to move it. If our power map indicates uh, that we don't have the power and support to move our target to support our issue, we need to move it, all right? Moving the map. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this and we can think through how we wanna do this. Um, either we can move stakeholders uh, from the neutral portion, right, the middle, towards the left side of the map. You can get them to care more about the issue. Um, so, Ideally, these are gonna be stakeholders who have more influence and decision-making power. Um, examples here might be a powerful union or a key elected official who eh, might not wanna take up this issue but can be convinced to. Uh, or uh, we can increase our own organizational power. So move our own organization up the map in influence. Uh, we can do this by recruiting new stakeholders um, also called coalition building, developing new leaders, and identifying unengaged activists within our organization. So building our power. Uh, so we wanna ask ourselves uh, when we're moving uh, groups to care more about an issue, uh, about the relationships that we need to build in order to move them over. So what are the relationships of the stakeholders to each other outside of the target? Um, who might try to whip neutral parties to the other side so that they care less about the issue or are more against the issue? Um, you know, is there somebody who is very influential who could possibly introduce us to more allies? And then when it comes to moving our power up to increasing our power, um, we wanna ask ourselves, what does membership no, and the only way to do this is to by taking part in an exercise called member mapping, which is where we comprehensively reach out to our membership as a possible, uh, as much as possible, we wanna figure out skills, time, uh, availability, physical location. If we don't understand our own strengths, we're not going to be able to uh, maximize our potential. And we wanna understand the strengths of everyone, um, not just the active few. Uh, in order to win our demand, we're going to likely need to do a little bit of both of these things. Now this next slide is uh, another, it's a graph, it's another chart, it's another way to think about um, relationships to a target. Um, so there are, we've got our primary target, right? That's the person who has the power to make the decision. There's also something called a secondary target that is the person or group that has power over those who have power to make the decision, okay? So we wanna figure out who those groups are in order to push people further to the left to get them to care more about our issue. So this graph is really helpful in thinking about that. Who are these decision makers? 
business associates, family, what media do they interact with? And then similarly, what, uh, uh, what, what do they work uh, for, like the other groups work with as well? Um, a couple of great websites that can help us think through these things, and these are noted on the worksheet afterwards, are uh, Little Sis and Open Secrets. Um, Little Sis is like a big, like money uncovering website for lots of powerful interests, right? Little Sis is the opposite of Big Brother. Um, and this will be on the worksheet that you get at the end. So I want to return to the idea of uh, disruption costs and the concession costs. So we want to know what is the cost of the support to our target and who is vulnerable to those costs. So this slide uh, has a image from a book called The Logic of Social Movement Outcomes. Uh, it is uh, this slide in particular comes from our friends at Austin City DSA. And you can see if you're reading the chart, um, what the predicted responses to movement demands might be. Um, so you can see who might be more willing to concede to a demand and who might resist more. For example, if the concession cost is high, if it is costs a lot to concede and uh, the disruption cost is low, meaning it is very difficult to disrupt this target with a tactic like a strike or a boycott. Those targets are going to be very hard to move. They're going to offer really durable opposition. Um, whereas if the disruption cost is high, they're very vulnerable to a tactic like a strike, a boycott, flyering, etc. And it doesn't cost them that much to meet the demand they're going to concede fairly quickly, right? So this is a really easy chart um, to kind of ask yourselves some questions. Uh, so, okay. So next I wanna talk about an example um, within DSA. Uh, look at this beautiful slide. So, this is an example of costs and vulnerability. So Heartland Alliance, and some of you guys might be familiar with this campaign, is a Chicago area nonprofit that intakes, uh, among many things, uh, intakes undocumented children into detention centers, AKA kid jails. Um, so former employees described these detention centers uh, a little bit like prisons. They felt like prison guards. Uh, children were expected to follow strict schedules, use bathrooms without locks. Um, these were, many of these children were those that had been separated from their uh, parents uh, as they sought asylum in the United States. We also know that Heartland Alliance prides itself on being a, an, the leading anti-poverty organization in Chicago. And they receive millions of dollars in grant funding, contracts, and private donations every year, right? So when organizers um, in DSA and also several other coalitional groups embarked on a campaign, the campaign was called Free Heartland Kids, they had to take the vulnerability of the organization into account, right? So Heartland Alliance relies on its image very heavily to obtain funding I mean, we're talking over hundreds, hundred million dollars of funding. And so they were vulnerable to a negative imaging campaign, right? That was their disruption cost. So this here is an example of a disruption cost at a rally held in front of their headquarters downtown. So this image that you see here is a giant puppet and she's got blood on her hands and the sash reads Mary Meg McCarthy, who's the executive director of Heartland Alliance National Immigration Justice Center, right? So this is something that an attendee would just see but the amount of thought that goes into it to think about where we're disrupting and who we're choosing to disrupt is really important, right? So in this case, Mary Meg McCarthy is our target and she is vulnerable because her good image is important for Heartland to continue to receive the funding that they need to continue their program. 
Um, just a quick note on the outcome. Um, so the the detention centers have not completely closed, but uh, the number of kids in the detention centers has greatly been reduced. Um, and now they're court ordered federally to release them all, which is not specific to Illinois, but it's very important just for folks to know. So now I wanna talk about power in DSA um, and a little bit more about that part about moving up our own power. So within DSA, we can focus on building our organizational power by member mapping, um, or as labor organizing expert Jane McAlevey calls it, she calls it whole worker organizing. So Jane McAlevey, uh, who's written a lot of great labor books, um, many of you've likely heard of her. It's hard to avoid her if you are at all around the organizing left. Um, she says that we ourselves are not ordinary people, but we ourselves are the key agents of change, right? So we are the ones who have the power. Um, and so this is a strategy born out of the CIO, right? And the AFL-CIO, the CIO part, and it's often called CIO organizing, um, meaning that you are going to organize with the groups that you have yourself. So when we're mapping our own members, we want to think about what we need to ask our members and why, um, you know, what social networks are folks from, uh, do they participate in. Uh, in the last training that Tristan did on organizing one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, he talked about you know, how to have a relational conversation, the better people get at that practice and the more um, our members do it, the better we are going to, be, to get at having an intuitive sense of our own networks um, because we'll have a better idea of where we have leadership power. Uh, we also wanna understand skills and experience. You know, have folks Canvas before? Do they have editing skills, programming skills? Um, you know, our volunteer base can make up a lot of money that our opposition uh, has uh, just by our own knowledge. And then also this might seem really simple, but when are folks available and how are they available, right? Do they have kids uh, that they're gonna be bringing with them? Can they risk arrest? Exactly. Um, the, I have a, there's a couple of questions I just, caught one of them. The author that I mentioned, her name is Jane McAlevey, and she is noted in the worksheet at the end. Um, she wrote a book called uh, Raising Expectations and Raising Hell, and she also wrote a book called No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power. Um, so I actually want to take a second right now um, and ask folks to uh, make some comments in the chat um, to do a little bit of an experiment and map ourselves briefly. So I would like folks to list three social networks that you yourself are a part of um, because I think that it's a helpful exercise in terms of mapping our own relationships to each other. So for example, I am a alumni of Avoda, which is a, a Jewish social justice organization in Chicago. I am a resident of the West Side, and I am a, see, this is a good exercise. And I also, um, I don't know, uh, am a former labor organizer. So I have a lot of connections with labor organizing and the labor organizing community. Um, so if folks can write in the group chat, that would be good. I want to see kind of like a list going, see if I can start seeing some, uh, seeing some similarities. seeing like different wards that people are involved in. 
uh, church groups, uh, alumni of college, which is a really important one, members of your union, that's a good one. Um, Eagle Scout, that's a good one, love that. Um, a member of your own uh, ethnic community, right? Uh, that's Yeah, this is really great. So like the kinds of workers that we are, um, this is just in um, our own DSA group right here that we've got all of these folks. Um, something important to note, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, I'm saying it anyway. Um, there's going to be a census coming out soon that's going to help us map our own DSA members. And so you should keep a lookout for that. Um, and fill it out when it comes your way because that's going to help us immensely do campaigns within DSA um, because we'll know who to reach out to. Um, a lot of comedy folks here. Uh, I made some very bad jokes earlier and I apologize. Oops, sorry, Sarah. <laughs> um, Amazing, yeah, 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 great. People understanding their own networks, right? So this, um, Tristan said, you know, having a, a JD, a law degree, right? That could um, give a certain amount of credibility. Um, perfect. Okay, so I wanna take a moment to talk about who, is a leader. And anybody who has ever been part of any kind of labor organizing training has heard this phrase, who is a leader and somebody back, somebody uh, shouts back, they have followers, right? There are, it's that simple, that's it. A leader is somebody who has followers. Um, this is sometimes known as organic leadership identification. Um, and uh, it's, something that's frequently asked, assessed, and reassessed by union organizers in workplaces. So in any campaign, there are going to be uh, leaders and activists. Uh, so an activist is a supporter of the campaign. They're gonna work hard to accomplish the goal. Um, they could potentially be a leader, um, but an organic leader, however, always brings more people with them, right? So within DSA, we should be thinking about who our organic leaders are. I can think off the top of my head, two or three people that when they call me, I'm like, all right, I'll do it, whatever. Um, those people are leaders because <laughs> they bring someone with them. Um, a true organic leader is going to expand our base, right? An organic leader in DSA um, can bring new people into a working group, a campaign, a committee, they can also be an influential community member who raises the legitimacy of a DSA campaign issue. So for example, an alderman who is a DSA member could raise the legitimacy of a DSA campaign issue. Um, so all of those things are important. So I'm gonna end there because I'm sure there's questions. And uh, like I said earlier, there's resources and a worksheet that's coming your way in an email. Um, and then I'm going to take a look at my phone because I think that there's been some questions that have come out. And then Sarah, if you want to let me know if any questions have happened. Um, while, while I was just barreling through here. Um, Sarah, the existing power maps and CHAP. Um, there is, so I, I see a question from Dave um, about whether or not there's a power map on specific issues. There is a power map. I don't know if it is available to share. However, um, I can speak with the organizer and see if we can whip up a version that is shareable. Um, uh, oftentimes an existing power map is uh, like a living document, right? And so when you put that out into the world, like super publicly, uh, 
your opponents can see it, but I can um, see if we can make something that's shareable. Haley, if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a couple of questions that I've gotten in my DMs that uh, people DMing me, I accidentally sent you the wrong answer, but I think it's kind of applicable to multiple people. Uh, if that's okay, Haley? Please, go for it. Okay, so uh, the first thing I will say is these slides will be available in the resources. Um, if you signed in at that bit.ly link that's upper, up higher in the chat, um, if somebody could post it again, that would be great. Um, if you sign in at that bit.ly link, you'll receive a follow-up email that's going to have things like this PowerPoint, the recording from this, um, as well as the worksheet that Haley's been referencing that has some other references, like the books that she's talking about, like the authors that she's talking about. Um, as well as a couple upcoming events that might be good for you if you are newer to DSA. Um, I did get a question that was like, I'm not entirely sure how to get involved or anything like that. Uh, I would personally always recommend reaching out to chicagodsa.org slash events, looking at if there's an event you would like to look at and attend. Anyone is welcome to attend any of those events there. Um, they're not closed off to just members or whatever. Um, I know we are going to have two weeks from today a coffee hour, uh, a virtual coffee hour. Um, and I think those are a really good space for newer people to come in and ask questions um, and kind of get acclimated a little bit. Um, as well as uh, signing up to be a part of the Rose Buddy program, which is a new program that we have. Um, where people who have been around DSA for a little bit have been partnered with newer members uh, for check-in calls and for people to ask questions and just kind of have a person that they can regularly ask questions to. Um, the other thing I would say is any question, uh, you can automatically just know that you can email me at my DSA email account. Um, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself after more people came on, but my name is Sarah. I uh, use she, her pronouns, and I'm the campaign coordinator for the chapter. So I have uh, an email account for that. That's campaigns at chicagodsa.org. Um, and I, a couple of people had emailed me before with some questions. I will always take questions there and answer them to the best of my ability. Um, trying to look at DM stuff, see if there were other questions. Um, Haley, I'm going to pass this one to you. There's a question about what resources are available to identify and facilitate partnerships between organizations. Um, so like between DSA and another organization or whose question was this? They're saying yes. So I guess I could take that as well. Um, unless you want to take a stab at it first. I mean, I think the first thing if you're creating, I mean, a power map is obviously you want to figure out who those organizations are and then figuring out who in your network has connections to those people. Um, in terms of resources, like, yeah, I, maybe Sarah, you want to take a stab at that. I'm not sure exactly um, what. Yeah, sure. So, um, there's loose and formal ways that we have connections to other organizations. Some of it's through coalitions we're in from um, voting to join coalitions. So like we're a member of the Lift the Band Coalition, we're active in that coalition. We know the organizers in the other organizations that are a part of that. And so we use that both for that um, coalition and purpose. And also we know that we can contact them about other things that are happening. Um, as well as we're a member of a lot of organizations um, in coalition uh, as a full organization, but also thinking through where our members are also um, involved and what connections they have because DSA isn't a monolith of like, this is what is happening in Chicago DSA, this is Chicago DSA's 
yeah, I don't know. I'm phrasing this weirdly, but we're made up of our members. We're entirely member driven. We're an entirely volunteer organization for Chicago DSA. Um, so like, I, as an organizer, have connections to other organizers in the city who are not members of Chicago DSA, and I utilize those and I introduce them to other organizers, um, if that checks out. Um, trying to go back to the chat for the question. So there's this question from, from Radhika about making decisions to spearhead, um, like about campaigns. So I think that's not how DSA makes decisions. Um, yeah. So. I can speak to that a bit as well. Um, yeah, uh, that question, so and sorry, my roommate is also on a Zoom call right now. <laughs> um, there's situations where there's work that comes out of um, parts of the organization. So like Democratized ComEd came out of the Environmental Justice Working Group of Chicago DSA, and now other organizations are a part of it in a coalition. But we see her spearheaded that um as people who are dsa members looked at what was happening in the city looked at what was happening in the country and what options existed um as well as did a little bit of research around like how energy works in the city um and then there are other ones where we get approached and ask if we will join um, a coalition or join an effort and we like sit and think about whether we're going to do that and we take a vote. Um, so Lift the Ban was an existing campaign that uh, existed outside of DSA before we joined and we joined uh, a couple years ago uh, and are very involved in that as well. Um, and for example, like the defund DPD campaign that recently launched, um, that came out of the list of demands that ban the Black Abolitionist Network put forward. Um, where they reached out to their networks and said, look, here's a list of demands, here's some trainings on how to do some of this. We want people in the city to run with this and like really create more pressure for this if we took that up um, in our structure as a chapter campaign. Uh, if that answers the question. Uh, Rachel, do you, you, yeah. Sorry, so there was also a second part where it says, are there current mapping campaigns people can get involved in? Yes, the defund CPD campaign would be a good one because it's just at the beginning. And so all of those steps about creating the power map are happening now. Um, and I just want to piggyback on what Sarah said. Hi, my name is Rachel. She, her, um, I'm helping coordinate these organizer trainings. Um, I'm a Northside member of Chicago DSA. Um, but just kind of, especially since I'm sure there are some people pretty new to Chicago DSA as a whole here, um, just to quickly kind of touch on our structure. Um, we do have working groups and we have campaigns, which are coordinated by Sarah that she talked about a little bit. Um, and the majority of our um, chapter wide decision making is made by the executive committee, which is a body um, proportionally elected from our um, city region. Um, I don't remember how many people they're in and now it's very large, 30 some people. Um, and um, that's kind of where these high level decisions of stuff that's come up for membership are decided on. We also have um, either three or four times a year um, membership um, meetings that require quorum. Um, obviously things are a little different with COVID, but um, that's when we have a quorum of um, all membership, not just the executive committee. Um, and that's how we determine things like bylaws changes, um, any other sort of constitutional changes to our structure, and also sort of larger um, guiding principles or endorsements for the org, especially um, electoral endorsements. So um, it, it's, it, there is a really large leadership body, but there is, uh, it is really important to note that we try to democratically um, select things that, that come from, from the broader membership. And so, um, just get plugged in wherever you can. Definitely the events website will help with that. Um, and email Sarah at campaigns. There's a question about this campaigns at chicagodsa.org and that'll help you out. Thanks. Oh God, it's over 40 executive committee members now. It's a big, it's a big. Um, are there any other questions um, for folks? Otherwise we can wrap this up. 
This has been a real joy and a privilege to speak with you all today. Okay, so um, reminder, there is going to be a uh, worksheet that goes out to everybody, including um, upcoming events, uh, resources, and terminology that I used today in the presentation, as well as the actual slides from the presentation. Um, so that should be out in a bit, as soon as that all gets together and we do magic with spreadsheets. Um, and uh, Thanks everybody for coming. This has been really great. And I can't wait to see you at the next one, which is in August and is on Rachel or Sarah. I believe it's August, it's August 8th. Um, it's August Sarah. 8th at 2.30 and it will be on action planning. Um, so look out for that email uh, that I'm going to send out as well as keep your eye on our organizational calendar, which has um, some of this information on it in the registration link. Uh, which is chicagodsa.org slash events. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. We'll see y'all see y'all in August or before then.